Hello and welcome. You're listening to Adventures in the Veil, vale, an RPG discussion podcast. I'm Jake. I'm Ross. Sit back and relax by the fire, for there are tales to be told. Take an L. I'll have that right out. Welcome to the Adventures in the Ville Tavern Cast. My name is Ross McClure. Here we chat about folk tabletop role playing games, including indie RPGs, but also the old school Renaissance. Today I'm joined with Eric Tinkar, your bartender in the OSR, proprietor of Tinkar's Tavern, one of the original OSR blogs. It's been said that blogs are the heart of the old school renaissance, and Eric's been reporting on news, highlighting product releases, sometimes reviewing, other times overviewing OSR products, and discussing the heart of this folk tabletop role-playing movement, this part of the hobby for years now. Eric, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on. I do appreciate it. Um, I, Eric, I'm going to start with the impossible question. Oh, gee. Okay. Let's, let's, let's see. So. <laughs> what is the old school renaissance? Oh, well, you see, that, that's that's the question. That's like, uh, what is it? It's the question about pornography, right? You know it when you see it? <laughs> that, you know it when you see it. <laughs> yeah. You know it when you see it. Um, the old school renaissance, which or the old school revival or old school role playing, which we don't agree on what it is, um, doesn't really have a central movement. There's no one leader. There's been attempts over the years for one person to kind of steer this herd of cats, but it is it is that it is it is herds of cats and. Uh, I think as a general large view of what the OSR is, the OSR is gamers that appreciate the old school rule systems and the old school mechanics when games maybe, I don't want to say it was simpler because AD&D 1E wasn't simple. You were house ruled it without realizing you were house ruling it. But there's this certain naivety naivety of uh how games were when a lot of us came into the hobby and it's very nostalgic and uh that's both great for the osr but it's also hard for the osr because it doesn't necessarily translate as well to younger players who came in with 5e and then you're giving them a rule set that is more open-ended most of the OSR stuff is, is open-ended compared to modern games. Modern games is a rule for everything. There's a ruling for everything. And uh, old school games is, if you don't know, if there's not a rule for it, be consistent and make something up. You know, and it's, a different, men- yeah, it's a different mentality. So uh, did, you, did you get started with one of the older games? How did, how did you get started? Uh, I started with uh, AD&D 1E, I believe it was either late 1979 or early 1980. Uh, my friend Kenny, who I'm still friends with to this day, uh, introduced me to AD&D because he had the Dungeon Master's Guide. He ran me through a solo adventure. And uh, I made my character's fighter name up. It was Cyrus. I think that was the Secretary of State, Cyrus Vance. Don't ask me why. I was a nerd even back then. And uh, we uh, played out an adventure where I was killing skeletons and other random crap. And at the end of the game session, Kenny got on the phone. This is back when a phone call cost 10.6 cents for your first five minutes. And had to call up a friend because he didn't have the player's handbook. He had to call up a friend to see if I leveled. And I was like, whoa, I mean, I'm playing something that can get better. This is 
cool and interesting. And that following July for my birthday, my parents got me the Player's Handbook, the Dungeon Master's Guide, and a set of dice. And uh, I was hooked thereafter. Nice. So then did you keep playing 1st Edition for a while? Because uh, what, 2nd Edition wouldn't come out then for, what, 10 Another years? Five. Yeah, we played... Uh, we played Woony, uh, we played, but we had that unearthed Arcana. We, and that was awesome and horrible at the same time because it wasn't balanced. When 2E came out, we of course had to go on to 2E. Uh, we didn't find too much differences between uh, 1E and how it evolved with unearthed Arcana and the, uh, the survival guides that added uh, non weapon proficiencies and uh, 2E. It, 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 the, the campaign that was going on just continued and morphed a little bit, but it, it didn't really change how we played until the uh, two week splat books came out. And that's when I realized that a company could really ruin their game by putting out too much material. But uh, that, that was what I did through high school and college and right up until my late 20s. Right up until your late twenties, and and then what happened? Uh, and then I got into the New York City Police Academy, <laughs> and in the in the academy we were we we were uh, Monday through Friday, weekends off. So the last game session that we had in my original group was March second or third, uh, nineteen ninety seven. It was the day before the graduation ceremony. So that Sunday was our last, our last uh, session. Because after that, I didn't have weekends off for well wow. over a year. Didn't have part of a weekend off for a long time. So and then that's when I realized that you know there's this issue with adulting. You yeah. know, <laughs> when you get into the real world, and it's like you know you, you. I was I was in the real world before that. I was working retail full time. But you're working a job where overtime happens when it happens and your hours can get screwed around just because there's an event going on somewhere. Um, it, it changed it and I stepped, I stepped away, but I didn't stop buying. So oh, interesting. When, 3, when 3E came out, I bought all the core books. I was buying all the... Uh, the uh, Forgotten Realm stuff. So I was, I was still on the cusp, and of course, my original gaming group at that point, adulting hit everybody, and uh, we actually moved to uh, EverQuest and Anarchy Online because you could game at 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning to be asynchronous. Either. Yeah, you could. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't dependent on getting the group together in one physical location. The, the VTTs that I could find back then, because I was interested in it, were things like Klug Works, uh, oh God, uh, Screen Monkey. They were really uh, VTTs that were, to say they were incomplete and hard to use yeah. is, is a misnomer. I, I was interested and I tried and I wanted to, but it, it wasn't happening back then. It sounds like, so the people you played EverQuest with were some of them, some of the friends you played AD&D with? Yep. That's and, really cool. And and it was weird too, because some of the, we had my original gaming group, who by the way, we still get together once a year. Wow. Uh, we gather in a, the Gathering of Fools is usually... In, in May, we lost one of our core group when the uh, wow. towers came in. Wow. And so we've been doing a gathering yearly since then. So And we don't game. I'll, we might dice. I might give away gaming material. I'll, I'll buy stuff and everybody gets like, you know, years ago. I think the first time I did that, I gave away Castles and Crusades, like the first print of the wow. uh, player's handbook. But I always bring something gaming related to give out because these people have kids and they still wish they were gamers but they want to be gamers on that on that everquest timetable of hey uh can we uh, all get together this saturday at 9 30 in the morning from 9 30 to <laughs> yeah. 
I'm like, dude, I can't, I can't do that. I, I need a steady day. I can't, <clears throat> I, I can't just randomly find a day for us to game. Yeah, I, I think I've went through that period as well. There, actually, I would say for the longest time that was the case. I think I watched my very first tabletop role playing game experience ever, ever, ever. I was probably 11 years old, and I was at a summer camp, and I watched a group of boys um, play what I think was White Wolf. This was in 1994, okay. and I think that they uh, were, um, I think it was absolutely, the, 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 the subject matter was disgusting, because it was a bunch of 11-year-old boys, and they were just trying to be as naughty as they could be, uh, but like the very idea of it, the idea that there was this, because I listened to the Game Master, and I was introduced to this concept of like call and response, this choice simulation where uh, the game master would say, all right, you're outside of a strip club and uh, you can see uh, there are people and they're beating up somebody nearby. What do you do? And then everybody's like, you know, and they get to make a choice. And then the, the game master moves the camera forward to the next place and says, okay, so you said you're going to try to interfere and tell them what they're doing. Well, they turn around and they pull a knife on you. And then, like, you go to the next thing and, and there's this, and, and like, never mind the, the gross subject matter these, these kids were doing. It was just the idea of that stuck in my crawl then and i couldn't find i could not find in the 90s i couldn't find anybody that would do that uh and then i i got my first book was uh star wars d20 like one of the w first wizards of the coast license oh, things. Yep. and uh i i took it i was i was in uh i was like a fresh no a sophomore in high school and uh and i took it to a camp and I ran it for people, and they all they made fun of me. <laughs> it was like the nightmare game master experience, and that fell apart. And then for years, and I was in the army, and for years and years and years, I tried to find groups and people that would play, and um, and it was that kind of desert of content, you know, where I mm -hmm. was, I want I would buy books and I would buy things, uh, but not have a group to play with. So probably there are people. I, there's no doubt in my mind there are people that watch your video blog that that's the case that they're collecting books and reading it and uh listening and i always tell them on this like at the end hey if you don't have a table here's something for a while and in the early actual plays like in 2014 15 back then um the really scrappy ones before critical role or at the first the genesis of critical role that was kind of part of my hobby because I didn't have anyone to play with. I listened to people play and they would, you know, cast a, a podcast of them playing and you'd hear them munch in on stuff and, <laughs> and you'd hear them like st chairs scraping across the floor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I didn't care. You know, I just wanted to hear well, that's that. The real, that's the real experience, man. That's when you're playing. With, if you can hear the uh, the Mountain Dew get spilled on the table, then you... <laughs> You, you you know you're in a real yeah real gaming. Concern. Sometimes somebody's yelling from another room while they're trying to get something out of the <laughs> fridge. But anyways, um, yeah. And then finally, I think the thing that opened it up to where I found people to play with was the D and D Renaissance. Right? It was uh, fifth edition came out. I think it was like in 2014. Um, yep. And the players' handbooks and the dungeon masters' guides hit the the stores, and suddenly D and D was everywhere. And um, uh, I didn't play D and D, but but anyway. So I guess just to say, if you're out there and you're listening to this and you don't have a group, uh, I don't know. I think that that's a, a valid hobby. It certainly it's not ideal. You want to play with people, uh, and there's also solo gaming. But welcome <laughs> out there if you're listening and you don't have a group yet. I guess so. Well, I mean, I I think that part of the the one of the issues with the hobby and bringing people into the hobby is that generally speaking you have to be brought in by somebody because usually yeah. the rules are 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 complicated <laughs> like if you look at like the dcc rpg somebody puts that tome of a rule book in front of you you look at it, you go oh there's no way i'm learning how to play this yeah when i when i retired as i was getting ready to retire uh, I always heard the nightmares that, well, if you retire young and there's nothing to do, you're going to just waste away. I was like, I need something to do. So I had this stupid goal in my head 
that I was going to make an OSR rule set that was compatible with the original rules, whether they be basic. Wait, or, were you already playing at that point before you retired? I was. I, I was back. Yeah, I was back okay. playing. I had a Saturday night. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do a little backtrack. When D and D Five E was being play tested, um, I was active on message boards, and I'd come back and played a little uh, on uh, fantasy grounds, but without voice. Um, I played in a Castles of Crusades game and a Dark Heresy game. And they were they were fun. It was all text, texting, no, no talking. And uh, I was dating my wife at the time, and these games were on Saturday nights. And my wife, who lived in the Bronx, and I live in Queens, would tell me, "Oh, you got this game going on tonight? Well, get me home so you have time to game." I went, "No, I I don't have to. I'm only a player. I don't. I can skip." She was very insistent that I enjoy this hobby. So when my friend Greg Christopher, who I knew from uh, Google Plus, was talking about putting together a playtest group for D&D Next, because he got into the uh, friends and family, the early playtest, uh, he asked me to, if I wanted to be part of this group. And he put it together uh, using, I forget what the, I don't think it was World 20 at that point. But we were using uh, Google Hangouts and a basic VTT. And I saw the difference between a VTT where Fancy Grounds looks beautiful, don't get me wrong. It's a beautiful looking uh, VTT, <clears throat> very automated. But to have that voice and video as part of your virtual tabletop experience yeah. transfers it. Listen, can keep people don't wander away for right. thirty minutes. In some ways, it's better. That's that's part of the secret there. Yeah, like we you know. do that. Your your friend uh, Joe the Lawyer, right? Like he has yeah. a he has a saying that I really like, and I, we kind of applied it to our play club. Because uh, yeah, we're connecting from across the world. I'm talking to somebody who's from Lithuania and another person from South America right now about doing an afternoon game in two weeks, right? And that's amazing. Okay. That's awesome. We're going to do yeah. some kind of OSR game. Um, and and I want to have that. But if you've ever just tried to dip your toes into on online tabletop role-playing games, there's barriers. Uh, but if you oh do it God. a certain way, uh, the, the, uh, the Joe the Lawyer has that, that saying, uh, yes, it's online, but we'll do it with an analog mindset. And part of that is, hey, video's on, we're talking to each other, we're real human beings, this isn't a video game, and the VTT is a tool, not any different than a Chess X vinyl battle map. And if it's just a whiteboard, uh, if it's just a scribble space, that's fine, but we're not in a video game and we're playing a tabletop game. And, and it's just transformative. Like, when you do it that way, uh, I mean, oh, it's it been is. amazing, yeah. I mean, early on in the days of World like I... I backed way too many uh, Kickstarters for VTTs, and I, back, I backed uh, Roll20. I'm a lifetime premium member, whatever the bonus was. Yeah. And uh, early on, when uh, when I was mostly, when I wasn't really doing videos, but I was doing my three, four blog posts a day, and we were, well, you know, I would be talking about the game sessions that we were running on Roll20. Roll20 reached out to me, which is probably about a decade or so ago early on in their existence, they wanted me to record a game session. Nice. And put it up on on, uh, on YouTube, and they would promote it. And I was honest. Now, you know, we're going to skip forward to the modern day. We've done three sessions of Shadow Dark with essentially the same group, the same core group. But what I told Roll20 at the time was, if I recorded this group, a three-hour session would probably have to edit out to about 30, 35 minutes. <laughs> after, I, after I remove the uh, the chatter, the truly tasteless <laughs> jokes, the ball busting, and I said, and additionally, <clears throat> with me in Roll20, and that's changed a little bit since then, but not much when I use it, but at that time, I was using Roll20 as a map with Fog of War so I could reveal where players were going. I didn't use tokens. I would use a pointer. Point to me where you are. This is where this is at. Because on when we played, we didn't have a game board. And 
I didn't use character sheets. I didn't even use handouts. But we did use the dice roller. And I told them that. And you know what the answer I got was? No answer. <laughs> no answer. They didn't want they didn't want to know because I wasn't using all the bells and whistles. I just I, I think sometimes the more bells and whistles you have, the less immersive it is. Oh yeah. Theater of the mind. Theater of the mind, I think, is one of the secrets uh, to old school gaming is that less is more. Uh, I've played 5e uh, at conventions and got had fun. Great GM, great group. Uh, had fun. The system works. I'm not saying it doesn't. But when my character sheet is an eight-page folder that I don't have time to read before the game session, um, that's a bit too much. You know, I, I, I upon retirement, Swords and Woods Relight was the genesis of my initial thoughts. Of, that was going to be my next I, question is, how, where was uh, that point? Did you go into D&D Next playtesting as kind of your first coming back into the hobby? And if so, was it like, would, would somebody say, hey, let's try this Castles and Crusades thing? Or how did you, how, how did how did this old school renaissance thing come about for you? For the, well, when I came back to the hobby... I, I started finding blogs. I found blogs oh. like uh, Rob Conley's Bat in the Attic, Tim Short's Gothridge Manor, uh, Grognardia, Joe the Lawyer. And I was like, I, 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 I could do this, maybe? And I didn't even know initially when I was blogging what I wanted to blog about. Did I, did I want to blog about old school games or... Uh, electronic gadgets like the Kindles and the early tablets. I was all over the place. And I uh, quickly realized after interacting with people in the hobby, uh, I'm also forgetting like Chicago Wiz. I mean, getting to interact with people. Because back then, how can I put it? There were blogs and there were forums. And the two didn't interact too often. They were like separate environments when it came to the old school gaming community. So blogging for me was a way to self-express and get ideas out. And I, I found I had a lot of ideas. So once I, I got on the on the blog train, I was blogging posts three, four times a day. Yeah. Uh, all, all about OS, old school gaming and indie games. I was touching on Spirit of the Century and other stuff that maybe general OSR players would look at and go, on oh, that, that. So I liked games that were lighter, you know, and didn't necessarily mean that they had to be... Why is that? Why, why do you prefer lighter games? I prefer lighter games because uh, I don't like being at the table, especially if I'm running a game, and having to say, oh, hold on a second, let me look at that rule up. Oh, man. <laughs> Because it, it, would you say it like takes you out of your imagination? Like it's this break, this moment where it's like, let's stop the imagination moment and let's get back out of that. Zoom out. It All right, now let's get back in. Yeah, it stops the momentum. Yeah. And it does break that immersion. And listen, I, I've been running AD&D, Osric, whatever, since the early 80s. Um, I could run that without looking at rules for the most part. I can still quote stuff. and we, we enjoy the lawyer's game. It's an ad and D 2 e game. My only questions are the small rule changes often between the two rule sets. But I like games that I can run without referring to the book. Because when you have to refer to the book, you gotta stop. And it ruins the momentum. It ruins like, the immersion. And that is rough. Especially... I was running games online, and when you run games online, even with the VTT, and maybe you've noticed this, it's it's harder to keep your players' attention because there's distractions. They're at a computer. It's a built-in distraction. I run a lot of games at, at gaming conventions. When I run games at gaming conventions, if I have an eight-person table, it's really a nine-person table because I don't sit. I, I tend to sit when everybody else takes the bathroom break. I'll take somebody's seat and sit down for five minutes. 
But I stand so I can walk around the table and I can make eye contact with everybody. And if somebody's talking, walk up to them, make sure that they're the focus. There's all these tricks you can do when you're running games at conventions to keep people, everybody, even those that are not immediately involved in what's going on, into the, the game session. It's harder to do that on a VTT. And if you have to stop to look up rules or stop and have a rules discussion, you're you're gonna lose your players. You're, you're, yeah. Somebody's gonna somebody's gonna go off. Listen, I, I'm in a gaming group with with everybody is a GM by nature, and pretty much everybody is a creative. And if if I lose somebody's attention, Greg Christopher is gonna be laying out his next product in the background as he's. Oh, well, I'm not needed now. Uh, and I don't blame him for doing that, but that's why I need to keep everybody involved. Yeah. And I'm not going to do that when I have to stop and look stuff up. So I find that for the majority of the original OSR style, like the older gamers, they prefer the original rule sets because they've been playing it since the 70s and 80s. They can play it in their sleep. They don't have to look up how many, uh, all right, how many orcs are going to be affected by this sleep spell if there's also two goblins in the room. They, 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 remember, they remember that chart, and they're going to figure right. it out based on the hit dice. Whereas if I'm playing 5e, I can play 5e. I can't run 5e. There's, there's no way. I've read the rules. I can't run it. There's just too many moving parts. Yeah. And I believe that a GM should intimately know the rule set that they're running because it's on them to be, uh, I don't know, like the programming language and everybody else just kind of latches on to it. Yeah. And input, but you are the one that has to to keep everything running. Let, let me pick apart some of the things then and because and yeah. you said, um, you know, so what is the old school renaissance? And you said it's, in a, a, it's like it's people that whatever angle and for whatever reason they have an appreciation they have an appreciation for how these older games worked but here are some things i'm hearing you say as you're kind of describing it too one of the things i'm hearing you say is it sounds like um and maybe i don't know if this is unfair and i'm not trying to uh, I'm not. I'm not trying to overly. It, it's funny sometimes how people will overly try to define or put into a taxonomy like everything. But mm-hmm. but it's also interesting. Like it seems like it's hard to define. First of all, so like oh, this this really? R part of the old school. It sounds like part of that R that you you, you and these other bloggers were is this mm-hmm. kind of community of collaborators and ideas and like this like. Versus, it makes me think, you know, like the take the R off, and it makes mm-hmm. me think of like Rick Stump, who there are people on Dragon's Foot, they just kept playing, they <laughs> they just they, oh, yeah. they never stopped, you know, right? So they just kept playing, and that's that's another thing. But it sounds like part of this R part of that OSR was that you all were ideas people and you were sharing ideas, so it sounds like the internet sounds like a huge part of it. Because there's probably oh. people that just kept playing 1E and they never stopped, or they played Beckman and they never stopped. Right. But for you guys, it sounds like this collaboration on the internet was a big part of how this thing has evolved and come out over time. Well, I think like Castles and Crusades was essentially a cleaned up AD&D 1E and showed that you could take the 3E OGL and you and the SRD and you could essentially reimagine an older rule set in Castles of Crusades is like proto OSR to some people it doesn't really quite fit every definition of it but I I think it opened the door it was like the Rosetta Stone for what followed once we got Labyrinth Lord and Swords and Wizardry and Osric these weren't necessarily reimaginings of prior editions. These were reworkings. This was saying, hey, I like that Model T, but it has all these defects, and man, I can put that together to where it just, it just works. Let me rebuild it and, and see with, with modern technology 
but still have it feel the same, but read a lot better. And I think that's what a lot of these reworkings were. I think Matt Finch uh, and Stuart Marshall uh, coming out with Osric uh, under legal threat from Watsy. Not a hard legal threat, but pretty much, uh, yeah, you can't do this. And they were like, yeah, stop us, <laughs> essentially. Um, now, is Osric a perfect uh, replication of AD&D. No, it's got certain house rulings built in that were probably common to the day, but it's it's it was written, Osric was written to be a publisher's tool. Osric was not written to be something where players were going to sit at the table, because people still had the player's handbook in the DMG. Osric was written so you could publish games or modules and say, uh, Free for you, Switch, yeah. Yeah, for use with Osric, which meant 1E. But people looked at Osric, including myself, when I ran my first... Uh, when our D&D Next playtest group fell apart because the D&D Next playtest was constantly changing the rules to the point where, as players, we get them frustrated, and Greg Christopher got frustrated, and Greg's like, I'm burned out. And then he goes, Eric, mm. can you run a, a, a game session? And I oh. was like, yeah. So I go. I'll run. Uh, I'll run. I'll run one e. He goes. Oh, okay. Interesting. He goes. I don't. I goes. I don't have one e. I go, yeah, my books are in storage. I go. Make it Osric. I have Osric in uh, in print. But it's the same thing. They work the same at the table. It's just I can't give you a page reference from one to the other that's going to necessarily line up. And I used Rob Conley's uh, Black Marsh setting, which was beautiful. It's a sandbox. And that was what I ran for the first time in. I don't know, a decade and a half, uh, was a mishmash of 1E and Audric, and it worked perfect. I didn't care if somebody was referring to the original books or the rewrite, the rules were the same. And uh, that's, I, I was already blogging, obviously, at that point, but that's when I really got this, my, my OSR juices flowing and started becoming a bit more of a creative because. I was not just a player, I was a DM. And I think DMs, GMs tend to, based upon that position in a gaming group, you have to present content. And even if you're taking content off the shelf, you are fine tuning it for your group, or you're creating the content and making it for your group, you become more of a creative if you're in that position it, it, and it looks like just looking at your website and some of your content over time it looks like then your song then for a long time stayed uh swords and wizardry light i don't know if you and now yeah. i'm kind of new to the to that so i've been doing osr stuff for i think maybe about three and a half years or so but it you know when i started everybody was playing old school essentials or lamentations of the flame princess but it's all BX, BX all the way down and all the way up, or mm -hmm. some kind of derivation of, of that formula, like Black Hack or something. Um, so I'm pretty new to the to like first edition and uh, original D&D and Swords and Wizardry. My observation is the DNA is a little different. That's just been my observation. <clears throat> um, but it, it, it I don't I don't know if you did what you think about that, but also it looks like that's been where you've been kind of operating for most of the part, right? Isn't that kind of like white box, swords and wizardry, advanced dungeons and dragons, that kind of thing? Oh. When you look at swords and wizardry, swords and wizardry is uh, the original, swords and wizardry has many different flavors that Matt Finch was uh, involved in putting out. The core rules, which were the original classes, and basically the original rules, I believe, including from Greyhawk without the original classes. White Box, which is just what is supposed to be a clone of the original White Box. And then you had Sword and Wizardry Complete, which was taking basically the AD&D classes that weren't in basic and putting them into the format for Swords and Wizardry. Uh, Swords and Wizardry, Labyrinth Lord, OSE, um, are all, at this point, in my mind, fairly interchangeable. Yeah, that, that's a good point, too. We're talking about 
some pretty fine yeah. hairs anyways, right? Like, yeah. it, like if you take somebody who's never looked at a role-playing game and they put down Labyrinth Lord and they compare it to White Box, they are like, this looks like, okay, the charts are different. You move right. farther and the turns are longer in this White Box thing and they're shorter in this Labyrinth Lord thing. But really, it's you're literally doing the same thing. Yeah, but... It, yeah, and that yeah. can't be said of fifth edition, right? Like if you can, if you plop down fifth edition, and you plop down white box, you're going to be saying they share a similar language, but these are two different games. Uh, these are these are different animals. Well, I, and I and I can actually speak on that because uh, I got an play tester. Story. Yeah. Well, now beyond that, because Swords in Which We Light was something that, the, and it, 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 this, this story will lead to the next one. But Swords in Which We Light was something that I had kind of conceived of in my early retirement i wanted something to keep me busy and my idea was i'm going to write an osr rule set that will be like they'll be like like the viral pirate rule set and you can print it on one legal size piece of paper and fold it over and you'll have like you know four pages on one sheet and it's going to be uh it's going to be like awesome and everybody can print it out and do it as they want you can leave it at game stores but something that lapsed gamers, Swords of Which We Light was written with the idea that lapsed gamers, gamers coming back to the hobby, shouldn't be hit with a huge rule book. They should be hit with something that they look at and they go, oh, and that makes a lot of sense. It looks very familiar. And look, it's, it's, it's not intimidating. Uh, and when I pitched that idea or brainstormed, I really didn't pitch it. I mentioned it to Zach Glazer, who happens to be the chief operating officer over at Frog God Games. And Frog God, uh, at that point, Matt Finch was part of the company and Swords and Misery was one of their IPs. And uh, I was asked, if you could do that and build off of, of an actual rule set, or build down, would you? I go, well, sure, but you know, how am I going to get that license? He goes, hold that thought. And he came back, he goes, all right, you got two months. I think it was two months initially. I thought I had two months to take the white box rules, 110 pages, and whittle it down to something that would fit on four, eight and a half by 11 pages. And then in that process, I was told, oh, you've got a week because they wanted to get it out in front of time for game hold. They wanted to get physical copies out and they had a print time. And I was like, oh, shit. So uh, I, I did a lot of... Uh, uh, highlighting and redlining through uh, some uh, copies of White Box. And with the help of the excellent layout from Zach Laser, uh, we got it to fit on a single laminated sheet of the two inside pages uh, were DM facing, and the two outside pages were the players. So if you were a player, you only needed to know two pages of rules and Swords and Wizardry Light is uh, four classes, four races, three levels, no experience points, uh, two spell levels for the uh, magic users, uh, I don't know, two dozen monsters. Uh, it got everything that you needed to either come back to the hobby or have somebody teach you the hobby without being intimidated. And proof of concept was in my niece, who was six at the time. I showed it to her, and her eyes lit up. And she went, Uncle, do you know what this is? I go, well, yeah, I gave it to you. It's... No, this is D&D &D in four pages. Yeah. And she's, you can teach me to read four pages, and then I can play D&D. &D. And I went, well, I didn't even think of that. But, so it became, it's, it's, it has brought a lot of people uh, either into the OSR or into the hobby. So flash forward a couple of years, and I'm at GaryCon. And, uh, what what I, year I'm, did Swords and Wizardry Light come out? Uh, I want to say 2016. Okay. Or 20, I, I think it's 2016. So a few years later, I'm at GaryCon. I'm there as a guest of Frog God because I'm... I work the table and I run games for them, and it was a year of bad snow. My my uh, my arrival time got moved back a day. 
and we had a, a, another GM for Frog God that just never showed. And I was running uh, Mouth of Doom, which is the 3D terrain uh, for Swords in which we light. And I would get the table, and everybody would get a copy of the rules to take home with them. You know, this is yours. Mouth of Doom from Rappanothic later, when they yep. had that? Yeah. yeah. Really My perfect. players have been in and out of that demonic mouth many, many times now. <laughs> So, um, my way of running it was, you know what, too many players have read it, and I got the whole thing mapped out in front of them, so I am going to run this on my own notes. They can see what they can see, but nothing is going to be as it was in the original. But I am told at, uh, I believe it was 2.55, that at 3 o'clock I had to run a game. And I'm like, what game am I running? I already had, like... Two or three Swords and Wizardry games that I, on my schedule, like, oh, you got to run a 5e game. I go, and I look, and it's Zach telling me. I go, Zach, I don't run 5e. I read the rules twice, and not even straight through the second time. He goes, well, he goes, I don't know what to tell you. you got a 5e group. So I grab my Swords and Wizardry stuff, because that's what I know. And uh, I sit down at the table. Introduce myself, and I say, listen, I want to apologize. You don't have the GM you're expecting. So, we have two ways we can go about this. I go, I do not know the 5e rules anywhere near enough to run it and run it properly. If one of the, you players at this table wishes to be my uh, DM assistant and essentially run this, uh, I am happy to do it that way. Or... I brought with me Swords and Wizardry rule sets. They're yours to keep in any case. But if you would rather roll up Swords and Wizardry characters, I can run that and I can guarantee you, you'll get a full session of gameplay out of it. Had a full table of eight. One guy politely said, yeah, that, that old school shit ain't my cup of tea. And, and removed himself. And I was like, fine. And as he got up, somebody else came along and goes, is that an empty seat? I'm like, yeah. So I lost one, gained one. And I had to explain character generation. And the players asked questions I kind of expected from 5e players. Like, where's the skills? There are none. Um, uh, goes, they, oh, this is it? Just four pages? They go, actually, for you, it's only the two outer pages, because that's all you need. Um, and I go, they're like, well, where's the equipment list? I go, well... For the starting characters, you just choose a starting package. And if you want something that's not there, just ask me about it. Well, then what do you do? I go, I make up a price if it's available. Oh. And the group started playing, and I had one player, and I don't want to say he was stuck on stupid, but he was stuck in that 5e mentality of, oh, I think they're lying. Well, why do you think the ogres are lying? Tell me. No, I want to roll. I want to, I want to detect lie. I go, you, you can't. Babe. Why not? Because there's no skill for such. Tell me why you think they're lying. I go, I, and the other players that were, again, five of players were like, yeah, you know, I think he's lying because I didn't like the way he said that. I, I, he, you, could, you smirked when you said it. I go, oh, did I? Let the player, you know, and I was like, some people were getting it. One guy did not. He was, fr and you know what? Not every game's style of play is for everybody right uh, i think we have to understand that um and and 5e is definitely a good system it's that it, it that tide raised all ships but uh after the session wrapped up out of my table of eight i had one couple it, that we had uh i think actually three couples at the table one couple came up to me afterwards and said um listen i know the vending room is closing soon right and i'm like uh yeah in about 10 minutes but I go, but we, we, we don't close until they kick us out, really. He goes, um, we want to go to the Frog God table and, and pick up a copy of the Swords of Wizardry Complete Rules. Because this was a lot of fun. And he goes, and it didn't bog us down in having to look stuff up. I go, and then the next morning when I was working the table, uh, another couple from the game session came along and did the same thing. They bought the copy of the rules and asked for more copies of Swords of Wizardry Life to take home to their gaming group. So, I think that there's, there's, there's one thing that really annoys the hell of me is that there are people out there that think that gaming styles are exclusive. Like, 
If I play an OSR game, I can't play 5e. Or if I play 5e, yeah. I can't play OSR. I am not looking at Rift. Well, I mean, I'm not playing Cold. It, you know, in their defense, frankly, 5e involves so much system mastery. And when you're in the bubble, you don't know that. When you're in the bubble, you just think that's how the entire tabletop role-playing game works. Because I've been there. I, I dungeon mastered 5e for six years. And I, I didn't know there was a Swords and Wizardry light. And I probably would have been that guy. I probably, <laughs> I probably would have been that guy. I'd be like, oh, I, I, can't, I can't make a perception check, you know. But uh, yeah. So, I mean, you know, like, uh, you don't realize it when you're speaking the language that you're speaking a language. But, uh, but the truth is that it's a heavy investment to know. I mean, you can dabble in 5e, like at first level, that, and it essentially looks like BX. That's how I ran it for a long time. I was like, ignore two-thirds of the character sheet. Only look at the your hit points, armor class, and your your stats, and the bonuses they give you, and your weapon modifier, and don't pick a spellcaster. Like, don't worry about it. And that, that was essentially BX, and I didn't know it. Um, but once you start understanding what a proficiency bonus is, how difficult terrain affects movement, the different condition states. Like, once you start developing all, well, why would you leave? It's like a, it's like an American Airlines rewards program. Like, you're in it. You're not going to go to Delta. Like, you're like, oh, I'm already, yeah. I've already invested in this all my, you know. So, yeah, that's, I think that's part of it. And and then another thing that I've observed is there are 5E hobbyists. Now, that's not, uh, I, I've had people accuse me of saying that's like a, like a elitism or something. But I, I don't mean it is that. Like, it's okay. <laughs> like, there are people that, it's not that they like wargaming. It's like, it's that they like Warhammer. And that's. It's okay, right? Like, I mean, you know, and there are people that they just like 5e. That's that's their thing, you know. But uh, and and they actually, I have a friend that that's what that's the way it is. He's tried a bunch of different games, and he's like, "Yep, that wasn't 5e. Yep, that wasn't 5e." And he had an open mind. He tried it. He just likes right. 5e. That's actually what he. That's what he's there for. <laughs> and you know, okay, like right, you know, cool. <laughs> but. Yeah, um, I, I brought up your website here, uh, Swords and Wizardry Light. Is this still free? That people can use Swords and um, Wizardry Light here. So my understanding um, is that Swords and Wizardry is now part of Mythmere Games. So Frog God no longer publishes for Swords and Wizardry or Swords and Wizardry Light. However. I do believe that Bad Mike, uh, North Texas RPG Con, still has copies of Swords and Woods Relight, and I believe that if you reach out to Bad Mike, he will still put copies in the mail, especially for schools oh, and wow. clubs. Um, I also have, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, now it's Continual Light. It used to be Swords and Woods Relight, Continual Light. It takes the concept up to about 16 pages and seven levels. Uh, and allows for some subclasses, but each subclass is basically a shtick. So, you know, a, a paladin is a fighter that gets some access to some clerical abilities. Uh, a ranger is a fighter who can track. Still doesn't use experience points. All it does is if you are a subclass, it takes one more game session to level for each level. So you're going to advance slower. But that's available on DriveThru and Amazon and was supposed to before the OGL fiasco, we had a new version laid out. I, I got a cover from uh, James Shields, custom done. Uh, beautiful. Uh, I, I have shared it in the past. Uh, we were going to put it out in digest size, and then the OGL fiasco happened. And although they did not retract the OGL, I have no faith in the OGL. I'm waiting for the 3.1 SRD to be put under Creative Commons. And then I'll make a few tweaks and finally get that out. But it's... Like, at, at conventions, I run Swords and Wizardry Light. I, I run it because I don't need to refer to the rules. And even if I did, they're only four pages. And if my players bring back a character from a previous convention, either the same convention or another convention they played with me, if they survive uh, uh, two sessions, they're level two. So if they survive uh, another three sessions after that, they'd make third level. And uh, I, I'll worry about beyond third level if, if they get there. But yeah. it's, it's the one thing that convention play never has. You never you never gain a level. But last ShireCon, I actually had players that were like, hey, I'm second level now. 
Nice. You know, it was kind of kind of cool for people to, to to people to say that. My wife would be able to say that, but she keeps on losing her character sheet. So, so let me uh, let me ask some questions about this just to, to clarify, and then I can put some of this in yeah. the description for the for the podcast episode. I, I have it up here. I'm looking uh, tinkarstavern.com, so we'll definitely put that in yeah. the the description. And up at the top right here has Swords and Wizardry Light free PDF. So yes, it, and that's, it, that's uh, I'm, I'm I believe it's still up on. Uh, I brought it up. It, it does look like you can get the PDF there. Right and then there. the other place I, I went through is Drive Through. Now that's really neat because the Drive Through one has a very pretty. It has the old fat the old. Um, uh, I don't, did Errol Otis do that? It's got the artwork yeah, from. It's Errol Otis. Yeah, it's, Errol Otis. it's very pretty, and so you could just print this out in full color on cardstock too. Uh, yep. And um, and they also have up, I believe, the character cards, which were also given away for free when we had them. I don't yeah. Know them and and yeah, and this uh, so, uh it, it, all you need the game is if your player is what's on your character card. It's amazing. It looks like the the pay what you want goes to Frog God, uh, but but you can look you get this for free, and I will, so I will also include this in the description. You know what's very funny? Here it is. I've, we've been running Swords and Wizardry. I've got the. Uh, put it back on the shelf but i've got the new one um which is not just a update of the old one you know i backed the kickstarter and yeah and we've been running it for a year and a half we have a ropinothic campaign where uh -huh. it's the best dnd we've ever played uh we're we're having the best fun in dnd and uh, at least half the players and, and myself will say that this is the best dnd we've ever played um and um and I, I went through a weird journey. I want to share it with you because I, I'm coming yeah. into swords. I, I needed this and I didn't know it. And I, and I want to tell you. And so, and also I want to share this on the podcast because, uh, cause I'm, I'm going to start kind of, uh, offering this out to people like you just described because so I had on, um, Daniel from bandits keep. Okay. Daniel from okay. bandits keep. He suggested, get the basic set. That's good advice, I think, because the basic set's good at teaching, right? It's written in very plain yeah. language. It describes what the game is. Uh, so I think that's good advice. Uh, I've also had, uh, I had uh, the Dungeon Minister. I don't know if you've ever seen his channel, Father I've, Aaron in I've, Canada. I, I've heard of him, though. I've heard, I've so heard he, of stuff about him. He's one of the people on the internet. There's only a few of them that do Beck Me. Like, that's their thing. And he, okay. he sort of proposed, hey, you should do Beck Me. And his reasoning is, of course, if you look at the, the Mincer starter set, it teaches you. And it has like a little solo play and like yep. it teaches you. And I think that is special. It teaches you from level one all the way up to being an immortal if you wanted to, uh, you know. Uh, so I've seen I've seen these different ways. How do you get started? I had Matt Finch on. I asked him, how do you get started? He had an interesting response. He said, it's going to be hard. And I like that too. I like that too. He's like, you're going to have to just try. And, you know, yeah. he was kind about it, you know, but I, 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 I thought that was great. Um, Cause the, I think one of the things about folks like you is you have this experience and uh, some people have no frame of reference. So I'm going to share somebody that I've met. We've been playing with as an example of this in a minute. Uh, but like when people talk about appendix in, I mean, man, you, that's just in your blood at this point. Like you've got that stuff in your dna code right like uh right. but like people younger than me they don't know what that is and they they never had that fantasy that forms the very basis of how this type of game would even work right well anyways here we are swords and wizardry at light i have a player came into swords and wizardry we have two slots that we rotate so that so that i and i say hey if you want to try the original game of dungeons and dragons uh, a retro clone of it albeit but mm -hmm. nonetheless it really shares the kind of the dna of that game uh we will keep two slots open if you've never tried it including if you've never been in an rpg period and we'll you you can come in and you, you can just play with us so this person comes in uh they're a young person they're 19 years old and they've never really played a role-playing game so I, I give as their kind of benchmark their level of experience they don't know to roll a d20 to hit a monster uh, right so that's where they're at right and I, I'm like, how do I convey? Now, I could give them something that teaches. I could give them something simple or rules light, like Mouse Ritter. I love Mouse Ritter. I think it teaches really well. I could give them something that fits on one page. 
It's interesting. Mm. This seems like the impetus for one page RPGs, which is a whole thing. It's become a genre, you know, uh, <laughs> so I want to get back to that. But so I'm trying to figure out how do I express original D&D? I can kind of express basic. I can I can express mm. that. But how do you express all of this, the importance of the environment and light and movement and weight and uh, swords and sorcery? Like, how do you get that? And uh, the audience can't see this. I'm going to put it in the description. But I just, I have Swords and Wizardry real hide up here. And you put it on one page. Like, so you said there are four pages. And there are. Well, it's, but, I mean, uh, it's, 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 a, it's an oversized page that folds. And it, it, by the way, it doubles the DM screen. But but yeah, but of four yeah. pages, right? So one page is just like, here's a total introduction to the game period. Like, here's how your character sheet works. Here's one page that's like, here are your options as a character, and you can just press it as if it's a button. I'm going to be a cleric, and here's my pack uh, of my yep. equipment. But the actual rules of the game, it says playing the game, and it has time movement, damage and death, healing, saving throws in combat, and treasure. And that's the game, and you have it on one page. So that's, uh, that's pretty wild. Then you have like a, a resource. I mean, honestly, somebody could just about make it up on that page um, if you had to. You know, there's that saying, right. everything's a bear. So you could just take a hit die and take a bonus to hit, and you, you've got something to work with there. But uh, the, the rules, you got the rules of original Dungeons and Dragons on one page. And I want to share, uh, and I feel bad if, if you're out there and you made this game, no shade because it was good. But before Swords and Wizardry Light existed, I think there was something called Microlite 74. So there's yep. a whole series called Microlite. It is neither micro nor light. Now, to someone who knows Dungeons and Dragons, it is. But if you, what, if you describe that convention experience you had and you're like i'm going to give this to somebody who's never played it they're going to be their eyes are going to cross like micro light 74 so yeah here it is so i'm going to put this in the description i think that's a big deal i think this well, well, another uh, my wife is a gamer because she goes she enjoys going to conventions she enjoys hanging with people at conventions she loves gamers and she enjoys playing in game sessions at conventions but she has, she has no interest in learning. That's books. like my wife. Uh, she just wants to play. She's she's not yeah. like me and uh, on here talking to people in New York City about like the finer <laughs> the points oh. of the hobby. You know, like she just wants yeah. to play yeah. sometimes. She, she just wants to play. But and it's no no secret if you followed my video channel, just we talked about you know, Gamers Health on Saturday nights. But uh, Rach is legally blind, so okay. a lot of times okay. uh, looking at a D10 and a D8, they look exactly the same <laughs> because with her with her eyesight she really has to pick it up and almost sometimes feel it and when i was thinking about writing swords of Witchery light i realized too by going back not by stepping back to really the roots of the game um i could just do a d20 and a d6 uh if you need a d4 to d6 minus one if you need a d8 it's a d6 plus one Gives you this, uh, this the same spread, and that way a D6 and a D20 doesn't look anything like each other. And what I was able to do while working the Frog God table, we had a bit of a bucket of odd dice, and when we would give out a copy of Swords and Wizardry Light, especially to a younger player, you give them a D20 and you give them a D6, and it's like that's all you need. I mean, generate your character, you probably would be happier to have three D6, but that's really all that you needed is a d20 and a d6 you weren't going to confuse players by oh i need to grab a d12 yeah. oh oh a, or a d10 uh what i just no, cut out just, the 3d6 yeah. thing i i mean it's great obvious there's a, there's a reason we do it in every single old school game but i cut that out when i had new players that then played before uh, I, I used white box because i didn't know i would have used swords and wizardry mm -hmm. light if i'd known about it by the way at the time but right. uh, but white box is similar, but I didn't have them roll 3d6. I said you have a plus one and a minus one. You pick. You want to be you yeah. want to be dexterous. Get a plus one and then minus one to charisma, and you have fewer followers if you try to hire somebody in the tavern or whatever. And, you know, yeah, loot, and then roll. Let's just roll with it. You know, like. you know, I I made one. I guess you could say I made one concession to 
the new school in, in gaming is that there's no penalty for a low score. And yeah. no, no bonus is better than a plus one. Uh, at, at conventions, like I'll, I'll, I'll do a house rule. I'll tell people, listen, if you choose to be a human, you can take your lowest score and make it a 15 because you're giving up on other stuff. But that plus one doesn't make much of a difference. And honestly, yes, I'd rather see my players. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd rather see my 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 players role play the low score. Right. And I told them that too. Listen, what are you putting your low score? Wisdom because you're a fighter. All right. Just remember your character is less wise. And when you make it a role play aspect, a lot of players will go, "Oh, I can role play that. That sounds like fun." Whereas if you just make it a mechanic, then people. And I'm not saying that min maxers aren't going to be the first ones to go, "Oh, well, yeah. So all I got to do is role play it. I'll put it." We all deal with those, and you know, you. you but at, at a convention, I want everybody to have a good time. And I find that players are more invested in a convention session when they can create their own character at the table. So we take 10, 15 minutes at the beginning to make sure everybody has a character that is theirs. And if it survives, has the potential to improve, you've changed how a convention game generally plays out. Convention games are usually one and done. Players will do stupid stuff at the end of a session because it doesn't matter if they die. Yeah. You know, so... Yeah, okay, so... Awesome. I, I'm really excited about um, taking Swor Swords Wizardry Light might be the thing I just keep start plopping down here. And I'm, I'm going to take you up on that and I'm going to hunt Bad Mike down and get a, a, an info hunt, and hunt say, hey, let me let me send you some some money here and let me get this uh, get, get some hard copies here and proliferate this. But um, yeah, so all right. A couple of other big questions here and I, I won't take any more of your time. I know we're we're running over a little bit but uh just to fit a couple more in here uh so the old school renaissance so we've talked about that it's genesis your experience in entering into it why we do it which i think by the way that has been basically the unanimous uh, actually i think this is a big if people listen they're starting to hear the difference between what i would just call old school which could be a lot of things could be uh mm -hmm. could be this which i'm having a blast with um, oh, Black Box Traveler. Yeah, Black Box Rose Traveler. Black. Yeah, you know, like uh, there's a lot of things are old school, uh, but then it yep. sounds like this Renaissance has some unique attributes and part, and there's the spirit of collaboration, uh, a sense of do it yourself. Like I have the game for my table, and uh, and and then also this sense of I want this to be fast. And every single person has said that. Every I want it to be fast and simple. I want it to be open to everyone. If someone has never touched this before, I want them to have fun. And uh, that's what Matt Finch said. He, his his main thing was he just was like, I just want this to be improvisational and fast and cinematic, and I want to have a good time. And so it seems like you all have tapped into that. All right. Where do you think it's going? What is it? Or where is it headed now? What's, uh, you know, obviously since those days since kind of the swords and wizardry days bx seemed to uh in terms of at least the signal space the the things that are being talked about out there old school essentials took over and it became like that's oh, the yeah. game and then uh and then there's there's other things that's kind of post osr so you have things like knave black hack and shadow dark which have like an important connection to the old school. Some people say it's beyond like a post OSR or, you know, uh, I, whatever though, really. Um, right. So where, where do you think it's going? What, what do you think this looks like in five or 10 years? Well, I mean, the, the impetus or the, the formation of the OSR was brought about by the OGL and the SRD for 3.1. It allowed all this hacking and creation to happen. That's what really caused that explosion. Um, and I think with the 5.1 SRD putting under Creative Commons as opposed to the GL, um, it, was, it was, quote, a gift to the community. I, I think it's also to make it a bit less viral. The, the OGL forces products in a lot of ways. You have to... You have to go through a lot of work to make an OGL product not viral, to make it something where it doesn't expand the material that others can work upon. Whereas the Creative Commons license 
you have to work to open up your own work. So I think what you're seeing is with a lot of these games, like Shadow Dark has its own uh, license for third parties to freely use. Uh, I believe uh, the same is going to be with Adventure Conqueror King System uh, 2. Uh, and with Dragon Slayer from Greg Gillespie. Everybody is getting away from the OGL and putting out their own license. Even Matt did with uh, Mythmere Games. He put out his own license for Swords and Wizardry because all these, we, we've learned that role playing thrives not just because of publishers. But because the community that forms around what those publishers have offered and the creations that come from that. And uh, you want your game to be viable. Well, you better be giving a, a, not, not a closed license, a license that's pretty, pretty good to your creators out there so they support your game. Uh, Shadow Dark is a lot of fun. I don't care if you, it's you having a good time. A you guys have played, what, three or four sessions? You having a good time? We played, played three sessions. Had a blast with each one, and I am surprised because I, I this is they, they play out like our our twice a month sessions, in that we really uh, have a very loosey goosey type of gameplay, and we bust on people. It was it was I I, I love Tom Barol. The fact that Tom fell asleep by the end of the session, we got to bust on him today. Um. But uh, I feel like if you I, fall asleep I, during the gameplay session, everybody gets to make mechanical choices about you falling asleep. It gets to it be, yeah. It, 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 that's uh, well, that, that that wouldn't. Don't follow my advice on that. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Rob, <laughs> to, Rob to kindly insists he didn't fall. He didn't fall asleep. <laughs> neither confirm nor deny. But um, I just past these guys' bedtimes. But uh, I I think the OSR will continue to bro it's not gonna it, there are people that think the osr should be in direct competition with 5e or dnd forever or dnd 2024 whatever we're going to call the, the new edition it's not a competition again this is not as this is not a zero sum you don't have to play one game in exclusion of all others i do think that the osr though is going to Fracture a little bit more, not necessarily based upon schisms in the community, but I think just based upon the fact that the games that we're getting that are coming out of the OSR are more house ruled, more right, stepping away further from the roots to make their own statement. Would you say that, that? Would you say uh, not to overdo some kind of cycles of history narrative or something like that? But would you say that that is similar to the early '80s or mid '80s with Palladium and stuff, or uh, in the '90s with like White Wolf? Is is this some kind of all right? Now's the time to balkanize. Now's the time to like have these other different little schools. Like you've got, you know, and then I, I don't know. Is this is this a cycle? Is this just? I don't know. I think it's a natural growth. I don't know if it's yeah. a cycle, because these are all games that you can look at and go, I, I still see its DNA. I still see its roots. Right. The roots, the, the roots still go back. It may have uh, morphed a bit, but but the community uh, again, energy is going to be different, right? Like if you're playing Axe Two, you want a certain mm -hmm. type of game. If you're playing Dragon Slayer, that's going to be a certain type of game. If you're playing Shatter Dark, that's going to be a different community. Really, I think. It looks they're, they're less generic to the original uh, clones or simulacrums, as some people prefer to call them, hew very close to their source material. And as these games evolve, as the system evolves, as the gaming environment evolves, people are now coming out and saying, hey, I've, my, my home game has morphed into whatever. Joe the Lawyer said he plays, he runs a 2E AD&D game by the book with, not kidding, two dozen pages of fucking house rules. Sorry for the, <laughs> you're you're a player in the game, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, so, so it's by the book with two dozen pages of house rules. But what you're getting now is we are getting 
releases that have taken that and gone, hey, I can make a profession. I, 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 why don't I publish this? And they're successful doing so because, like Dragon Slayer, I, I told Greg, if I was going to house rule uh, basic OSC Labyrinth Lord into something that I'd want to see reflected in my home campaign, how I'd enjoy playing it, it's Dragon Slayer. I can see the roots of this game. But where where he took it, like the monk class that he has, is not your you know faux Asian monk. It's it's Friar Tuck, and it's a staff expert. And I was like, oh, that fits. I like that. You know. So, but I do think what you're gonna have too is you're gonna have a lot of circumstances where home groups are playing. Uh, well, yeah, I'm playing Shadow Dark, but I took a few things from Dragon Slayer, mm. and we had this thing from Knave that we like. So I think that the home group experience is going to be a lot more homebrew. I can, I really do see that becoming a thing. And I hope at so. Some point, to be honest, I, 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 I say like in home. life I'm not, but in the tabletop world I am chaos aligned. Like I, I love the. <laughs> I love that there's so much, uh, I don't like the discord, but I like the, the basis of the discord, which is that everybody is so different. I love that. Like, I, I don't know. I'm a big fan of that. I, I'm anti-orthodoxy of play sometimes is what I'll say. I like that there's lots of different ways to skin the cat. Fair enough. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, like I said, I, I see the OSR to be growing. It's not going to be exponential like its initial growth was. But I don't, I don't see it shrinking. Is it going to be as viable a market as, say, 5e or D&D 2024? It, it's never going to reach that size. Yeah. It, it, it's not commercial enough to do so. You know, yeah. I, cool. Um, Eric, thank you so much for talking to me. Before we go, um, like I said, I'll put your website in the description. I'm also going to put... Uh, the drive through link to Swords and Wizardry Light. I needed that thing about four years ago, and I didn't know it. Five, six years ago. I needed that a lot. I needed that in the beginning. I was the guy that, that needed that needed to go to that convention okay. and sit in that seat. Uh, so well, you see, that, that's what it was written for. It was written so people that have lapsed from the hobby or want to learn about the hobby, for, yeah, you're not going to... It, 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 it's, it's a great way to introduce... I don't think you can learn how to play... D and D, the generic terms. I don't think you can learn how to play an RPG just by reading it because that right. wasn't the point. The point was I can give you this and and you can look at it and read it and you could be running a session by by somebody who's a little bit more experienced and go, wow, this all makes sense. Yep. Especially if you played back in the seventies, eighties, nineties, early aughts, and now you're coming back. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so I'll put that in the description. Is there any other I know you got a bunch of big stuff coming out, coming around this year in 2024. Are there any announcements you want to make? Anything you want to share uh, coming up? Uh, any, anything you want to announce or share? Nothing really. Uh, no, no major announcement. The uh, aside from we're adding uh, fireside chats. Uh, yeah, to I saw the, that. Uh, YouTube, YouTube roundup, which is going to because we have guests frequently on the live streams. But not everybody wants to stick around for two hours to listen to a bunch of guys hang out like they're at the local pub and talk about stuff. So it's going to be a bit more focused, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so that should be kicking off. Maybe start recording some this weekend. Okay. Um, people that I normally don't get a chance to to bring on. And just to find out how they get, like you asked, like how did you get into the hobby? And like, how did you become a creator? Yeah, my yeah, friend Jake and I, we're, we're starting to feel for us that this is like a pillar. Now, I, I, I say that somewhat tongue-in-cheek because I don't know if I subscribe to this Pillars of Play model where you got exploration, combat, and social. But uh, if there were, it might also be exploration, social, combat, and talking about it. <laughs> like I, I like yeah, to just I chat know. about it, you know? And, and uh, sometimes it's hard to fit that in. I really enjoy that about your YouTube channel, too. And I'll, put a, I'll also put a link to your youtube you. channel and for everybody listening there's a lot of good live stream content and uh it's pretty frequent so you can join in and just chat or you can watch them play you can watch them play shadow dark and um 
Yeah, it's, so it's those, a lot of you know, fun. Dark Live plays are very popular. I, I'm yeah. very happy to see that. But yeah, we do uh, a live every Wednesday night at 8. Uh, every Friday night at 8, except for the fifth Friday of the month. This is the fifth Friday we don't. And uh, lives on Saturday nights, which is less about gaming, more about uh, the whole journey of uh, health and uh, showing folks that not yeah, everybody has health issues. Rachel and I, my wife, we uh, we spend our, our an hour every uh, Saturday talking about our journey and talking about That's other great. people's journeys. And, yeah, you know, it, it's the thing that people, it, it's like nobody wants to talk about it, whether it's right. in gaming or otherwise. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, we, we, we talk about it to let people know that their experience isn't, you know, their own, their own baggage to, to bear. That's you fantastic. Can, can so. Yeah. I, um, uh, one of the reasons I've been doing this and I, 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 at one point I ran or played seven games, no, no, eight games a week. And the reason is I was, I've been uh, disabled from work. I have multiple health issues where I've been disabled and it was, um, it's very scary to discover that your body, some, you know, you can get to a point where your body just does something and you don't have any control over it. And, and yeah. I think another thing that's, uh, to note about that is in that time, tabletop role playing games brought me a lot of joy and they were, it was something, uh, and this experience of being able to do it online and meet people around the world and get to play really kept me going. And, uh, and it was uh, crucial. I think, I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know how I would have made it without, without, uh, without the, the, the tabletop world. And on the other hand, the other thing I, I think in all honesty is at the same time, it was also a terrible experience because, um, there's a dark side to the tabletop world. And I had to learn how to, uh, I'm still learning. I want to say, say that I figured it out, but I, I'm, I'm needing to learn how to cope with that. I'm, I'm a very sensitive person, you know, like I don't like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't like being, you know, um, people being mean to me or other people and stuff. And so, uh, there's a lot of that in the hobby, most yeah. overwhelmingly kind people. Like I would say nine out of 10 and then one out of 10 is just like monstrously mean and do things that are kind of spooky, scary. And so, um, that was hard when you're when you're powerless and you're disabled and and people don't know uh, they'd say oh you don't have a life you're on and i'm like yeah you're right right now i don't this is my life this is the connection i have with other people i can't leave my house and so and now th so thank god i'm i'm recovered so i'm heading back to work thank god like right so i had some surgeries i'm good to go very thankful uh recovering very well but i think it's worth thinking about that that there's a lot of people that you know that's the case that's this is their this is their joy and so it's worth i don't know it, 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 when you encounter people and some people might be in a lot of pain like literal yeah. like literal physical pain uh and people aren't at their best when they're in physical pain you know so um I, you're talking about the internet and the internet is yeah. is is like the uh I, was it the uh, the bar I used to occasionally? Yeah, you said it's like a bar. Yeah, the, yeah, but but it's 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 like the bar that had the sawdust on the floor to, to make it easy to mop up the uh, the, 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 the urine and blood and and whatever else. I've been to one of those. <laughs> that's, that's but that's the that's that's what the internet does. Is it? We talk about beer muscles and joke about beer muscles at like you got your local pub and somebody's talking shit and you're like. They wouldn't be talking that shit if they weren't on that six pint. Well, you know what? The internet puts you on that six pint right away if you're yeah, that's true. already predisposed to that. Because you're like, oh, they can't get me. I'm on the other side yeah. of the room. And I, I've, do, I've done that. I'm, I'm not better than that. I've done that. I've, I, I've absolutely. Um, but I, I try to think about that now. I try to think, you know, this might be this person. We had we lost a person. I don't mean a character. I mean a person. Lost uh, one of our players this past year. Uh, he had MS. And... Uh, so again, that's, this was his life and his family didn't even know about kind of this part of his life. He couldn't really move. Um, and so what he had was what was on the screen and he played tabletop games with us and it was a joy. And, um, I think, I think maybe it's worth for me at least thinking, you know, maybe that's the case with this person. Maybe this is something 
more closer to them than I realize, and maybe they're not at their best right now. Um, and so there's a lot of people out there, I think, I've met a lot. Um, actually, I would say a whole portion of our play club are like disabled people and people who are in various ways. So, yeah. So anyways, I really appreciate that you do that, that, that you say, let's talk about life and, and health and yes. it's a real thing. And let's not shy away from death and from pain. And uh, that I, I love that. I think that's a, a really special thing that your, your uh, video blog, if I may call it that, you know, yeah. sort of, uh, offers. Yeah. Thank you. I, 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 you know, it, it's, it's, the, it's something I look forward to every week. Not just because I do it with my wife, but because, you know, I, I did a career where I was like, if I change one life for the better in 20 years, I know I, I was successful. And I treat the Saturday Night Gamers Health as if I can help one person uh, cope with whatever's going on with them, then I know I've been successful. Yeah, that's fantastic. All right, Eric, well, thank you so much for, for joining you. us. Oh, definitely, man. I appreciate it. Mythic Mountains RPG is a private online play club that focuses on folk RPGs. Folk RPGs are the games that belong to all of us. They're what actually happens at a table between friends. It's their voice that has the authority of what is fun and what works for them. Weekly, we upload our games to allow others to sit in with us. The channel isn't monetized. We don't own the artwork, music, software, or games shown in these actual plays, and you can find links to their authors in the description. Like, subscribe, and share if you wish, or don't. Just like games in person, you're welcome to pull up a chair, set in, and watch some of our games. No performances, no fancy equipment, just regular people playing full pencil and paper role-playing games and having a good time. We hope these games will prove a source of enjoyment to anyone just wanting to listen in, anyone looking for examples of how actual groups run and play folk RPGs, and most importantly, if you haven't found your group yet, you're welcome here. Thank you.